Who would have imagined that the opulent 1980s, full of Coke subsidized skinny Piget washes, polished 457 Magnums, and M203 grenade launchers, who could have imagined that the 80s could give rise to two of the most rawly functionalistic modern tools that the world had yet to see? Yet this is what we find in both the Glock and in the G-Shock. You're looking at the current version of the original G-Shock, the DW5600E, as well as a Glock 19. They are both evolutions of a classic. Taking into consideration the respective origins and core design philosophy of Glock and G-Shock, I'm going to stake the claim, develop the idea, that the DW series of G-Shocks, currently the 5600E, is the Glock of watches. This is going to demand a close look at Casio's Triple Ten philosophy, as well as a quick crash course on the Glock. After that, I'm going to drop this watch off a seven-story building. Let's get started with the G-Shock concept, or more properly, the Triple Ten concept which was central to the development of the DW series G-Shock and all G-Shocks. Triple Ten is probably best understood as one of the later fruits of the quartz crisis of the 70s and 80s. The landscape of horology was fundamentally altered by the development of microelectronic quartz technology. Suddenly, the wristwatch was transformed from a high maintenance luxury item to a disposable mass consumer item. Yet there is an even deeper paradigm shift on the horizon, which would call into question the basic concept of watches. What is the function of a wristwatch? What are the limits of a wristwatch? What are the limits of a watch's functionality? What can a watch physically endure? Now this takes us to 1981, when Casio's design team began a project to develop a multifunction LCD watch that would be able to endure anything that the human body could encounter. A watch that, by its design, by its toughness, would last a lifetime. But it would be a design that would be rooted in the quartz technology rather than in the mechanical technology to ensure that toughness. Nothing like this had ever been done before. To this end, Casio developed a threefold concept to meet their engineering objective of this so called heavy duty sports watch. It was a triple 10 concept, a minimal 10 year battery life, 10 bars or 100 meters of water resistance, and the ability to withstand the shock of a 10 meter free fall. The most dramatic of the criteria, the gravity shock test, ended up being the name that the G-Shock would receive. The key to achieving the G-Shock objective was through the floating module concept, which was a new way to encapsulate the quartz movement, and secondarily through a simple and highly functional use of case and bracelet materials. The breakthrough idea was a hollow structure in the case form, which allowed for a quartz module to be quote unquote floated in order to provide shock protection. The entire watch structure was made out of urethane, which enabled a um, shock protection on the outside of the module. The module itself was protected by cushioning material for the key parts such as the crystal oscillator, which would especially need extra protection. In summary, the G-Shock could somewhat be defined by the simplicity of its components, a urethane rubber bezel, a simple hardened mineral crystal which is protected by a urethane bezel 
a floating module concept, which is itself encased in a stainless steel case. Okay, okay. At this point, the G-Shock purist is probably thinking, <clears throat> well, okay, so he's saying something true about the 5000C DW series G-Shock, the original. But there's a lot of changes that have happened since then and now with the current itineration G-Shock, which I have in this video, the 5600E. I would try to stir in my heart some solidarity for these nerds and talk through the various 5000 DW series watches, you know, discussing maybe different materials uh, that have been developed for the case design, originally more acrylic, moving more towards a polymer, you know, talking about the differences in the modular construction going from a more solid steel uh, modular case to a plastic one and of course talking about the infamous uh, use of a stamped screwed case back rather than a threaded solid stainless case back which is a humongous falling away from the original vision uh, a cheapening of the ideal um, and probably at the sacrifice of luxurious convenience like electroluminescence. Thank you very much, Timex. I'm going to take a little bit of a gamble and just kind of come out and say that the 5600E is not really a radically different watch than the original 5000 series. It's basically a plastic watch with a floating module. Yes, the plastics have gotten more sophisticated. Yes, the modules have changed. Yes, some of the details of the shock resistance have changed, but it's basically the same. The current 5600E is still probably the purest G-Shock of the current G-Shock family. As far as the DW5600E's module goes, if you want uh, the ins and out of all the functionality, how to use it, there are plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to use one of these watches. Uh, my comment is that uh, this particular G-Shock has the really essential modular functions. Of course, the beauty of a module is that it's totally open concept. At this point we've developed what we need in order to really start making a detailed comparison to the Glock pistol. Now for those of you who aren't as familiar with Glocks, the history is very interesting. The Austrian army needed a new service weapon in the early 80s and in 1982, uh, very close to actually when the G-Shock was being developed, Gaston Glock started approaching a new design concept for a service pistol. The idea was core simplicity of parts and functionality. There was essentially a number of operational mechanisms and features that enabled a Glock to become extremely modular. This modularity was very significant because what it pointed to was an incredible durability that arose out of the simple material and design choices. Of course, what I'm talking about more explicitly is the innovative use of polymer in the construction of the gun and the use of only 34 or 38 parts in all of the components, uh, as well as the fact that the gun could very easily be disassembled uh, without any special tools. There is an incredible amount of interchangeability of parts between the various Glock models, and there's been amazing endurance tests with Glocks on the uh, pistol training website. There have been guys who have fired over 70,000 rounds through a G17 with no malfunctions. Okay, so this has been fairly far reaching. Let's explicitly draw out the similarities 
of the G-Shock and the Glock. Both were developed in the 1980s as an attempt to achieve a greater level of toughness and durability through simplicity of design and innovative implementation of materials. Both employ a modular design which opens up possibilities for creativity and swapping components. But behind the modularity and the innovative construction and material use is a core idea of simplicity. The idea that purely functional design is going to be the most reliable design. I would be remiss to omit that evolution arises easily from simplicity. Every generation of these products have improved. Now, of course, it is a little bit more complicated than that. In many ways, the G-Shock line has improved because there's a huge variety of models that go beyond the original DW5000 series. Is a Frogman tougher than any of these DWs? For sure. Um, is a aviation watch more interesting than one of these DW watches? Sure. Um, similarly with the Glocks, you know, now you've got alternatives uh, that might arguably be better than a Glock. I don't know. Would you prefer an XDM to a Glock? Why don't you tell me? Um, so I'm not exactly intending to draw too tight of a comparison, but just enough of one where we can see that there's a core design philosophy that's shared in common with the G-Shock and the Glock. At any rate, I think we can appreciate the implausible beginnings of these tools and the ingenuity behind the evolution and simplicity of their core ideas. Here we go. This time I'll make sure it lands on some pavement. Seven stories. More than double the original design objectives. And we are good. <laughs> Thanks a lot for goofing around with me in this video. Please consider liking and subscribing. I'm a survivor. I'm gonna get up.